Welcome to the Andy Social Podcast. My name is Andy Dowling, and sometimes you may see me prancing around on a stage playing in a heavy metal band called Lord. And if you love a bit of old school heavy metal, you can go over to lord.net.au. I've got all the uh, social media pages, ways to access our music, buy our merchandise, buy our tunes, whatever it might be. It's all over at lord.net.au. You can go and give that a crack, and hopefully you will enjoy the music. In addition to that, I also host the Self Starter Podcast, which is all about self-employment, small business, and freelancing. If if you want to go and check any of that out, you can go to selfstarter.com.au or you can listen to Self Starter on your preferred podcast player as well. Speaking of which, I am a finalist for the 2018 Australian Podcast Awards for host of the year for the Self Starter podcast, which is just insane. So a massive thank you. And it's great to see that uh, you guys, um, all the support that you've been giving me through my other venture being Self Starter is paying off and I've got a little feather to put in my hat. So thank you very much. Now, speaking of thank yous, for anyone who's new to the podcast for the first time, each and every week of the podcast, I do a shout out, a public thank you to somebody that supports this podcast in a whole range of different ways, whether it be leaving reviews on iTunes or on Facebook or any any little nook and cranny on the internet. Um, it could be sharing the podcast around, shooting me a message of encouragement, buying merch or uh, shouting me a beer via andysocial.net. Anything and everything uh, goes a long way to helping me with uh, the Andy Social Podcast, helping Self Starter, helping Lord, everything that I'm involved with, and it goes a hell of a long way. So thank you very much to everybody that's been so responsive to this, and I can't wait to thank you all in the upcoming weeks and months of this podcast. But this week's shout out, this week's thank you is for an old mate of mine, Steve Lammy. Now, or maybe it's Lambie. I've never bothered to ask you, Steve. I just call you Lammy all the time. So anyway, I don't, I've known Steve for years. He's an absolute champion. He's one of my best mates. And um, he's been a huge supporter of Lord. I think he's bought pretty much everything that Lord's ever put out. Um, and he's also bought the Andy Social T-shirt. He supports both podcasts. He's just been absolutely fantastic, and I'm really proud to to call Steve a mate of mine. And uh, if you want to check out Steve's podcast, Steve has a podcast called The Blindsiders, which is all about NRL, which is our uh, national rugby league uh, sport. You can tell that I'm a big sports fan. Sorry, Lammy, but <laughs> you can go and check out if you want to. If you're into the NRL, then perfect. You should definitely check out the podcast. But if you're an international listener and you've never really got into or bothered to discover what uh, rugby league is all about, then maybe this could be a great introduction. So you can go to nrlhub.com or you can search for the blindsiders on Facebook or you can search for the blind blindsiders, my bird, Larry, shush. You can search for the blindsiders on your preferred podcast player as well. But a massive thanks, Steve. A lot of love from me, and I really appreciate the support that you uh, give me. Um, when you eventually listen to this episode, please shoot me a message, and I'm going to send you out something stupid. Or maybe when we go to Japan together at the end of May, I will give you something special over there. That sounds really sus. I'm so sorry. Guys, I almost forgot. This is a weird edit that I've just thrown in the middle of my intro, but I almost forgot to add that this week's episode, as with last week, and the next couple of weeks, is sponsored by Design by Jaden. Now, Jaden Fai is a freelance artist. He does a lot of digital artwork for bands and artists, a lot of stuff in the music industry. You can go to designbyjaden.com, which is designed by J. A-I-D-E-N.com. And uh, Jaden's been really, really generous and he's offering a free custom piece of artwork for an album cover or a t-shirt, or if you're not in the music industry, potentially Jaden can help you out. Um, but I would definitely go and check out his work first to see if it uh, is up your alley. But um, some amazing, amazing artwork over on his website. So please go and check it out. And if you want to get into the running to win a uh, custom piece of artwork, all I need you to do is to leave a review for this podcast somewhere on the internet. It can be on Apple Podcasts, it can be on Facebook, it can be on any platform anywhere on the internet because it all helps me. And all I need you to do is send me a screenshot or a link to that review and then you'll go into the running to win this free piece of custom artwork by Jaden. So um, I'm going to leave this open, which I think I failed to mention in last week's episode, but I'm going to leave this open until Sunday, May the 6th. So I'll leave it open for a few more weeks. And uh, please send me through any reviews that you put anywhere on the internet. It's all greatly appreciated and you will go into the running to win uh, a custom piece of artwork from Jaden. So that's designedbyjaden.com. Thank you very much, sir, for contributing to the podcast and being my first ever sponsor. Now back to the rest of my intro. This week's episode is with Sid Green. Now, Sid Green is a producer. He's a recording artist and musician. He's been around the traps for a long, long time. Larry, shh. 
and he has a really, really interesting history in the music industry. Um, you may know Sid as the uh, drummer in Mantissa, which is a big 90s uh, sort of hard edge groove rock sort of funk band. Uh, I'm probably completely butchering the genre of music, but that's what I sort of get out of it. Uh, from the 90s, he also played in a band. Oh, actually, Mantissa used to be called Killing Time as well for some of those old school Aussie music fans out there. They'll identify with that. Um, he later played in a band called Iota, um, which were ARIA nominated. Um, he's played with amazing bands over the years. Uh, the Red Hot Chili Peppers, Jane's Addiction, Pantera. They play the big day out. Um, they've had massive success, a number of video clips, some really, really cool stuff. Um, in the late nineties, um, he started getting into sound production and he had a couple of really interesting mentors, which uh, Sid talks about one being Michael Letho, who, um, you might know him from Rockwiz, but he's also worked on albums with Daryl Braithwaite, Rick Price, Rush. Amazing. I mean, if you go on Discogs and search for Michael Letho, L E T H O, you will see how much stuff this guy's been involved with an incredible producer. In addition, his other mentor was a guy called Terry Date. Now, a lot of you metalheads might know this name. Uh, Terry Date's uh, been involved with some amazing uh, metal albums over the, the last several decades, uh, bands such as Metal Church, Overkill, Pantera, um, but also bands like Soundgarden, Dream Theatre, Mother of Love Bone, Screaming Trees, oh, Dark Angel as well, of course, and Mantissa, which is where um, Sid uh, has the connection with Terry and um, some really, really cool stories, which we get to later in the chat. But about uh, 10 years ago, uh, Sid relocated down to the South Coast and he has his own recording studio down there called Mono Nest. And he um, does a lot of uh, production for bands um, and has people come down there and actually spend some time down the South Coast in a, in a pretty chilled uh, environment and, and work through and create music together. But he also does a lot of stuff online, as uh, many of us do with uh, the power of the internet and sharing uh, files with people from all over the world. So um, he's got this really successful business. This studio called Mononess is absolutely fantastic. He's been around the traps for a long time. And uh, I'm not putting your age out there, Sid, but um, you've got a, a long history there in, in the music industry here in Australia. And it's really, really impressive. But um, one thing I will mention before we kick into this chat with Sid is that I'm going to have a more condensed version of our chat featured on my self-starter podcast as well. Um, being in the Shoalhaven area in the south coast of New South Wales and having his own business, I thought he was a great candidate to be featured on Self Starter as well. So in the coming weeks, uh, there'll be a refined version with my usual format for Self Starter highlighting Mono Nest, and uh, you'll be able to check that out. So when once that episode does go live, I will update the show notes over at andysocial.net. I'll put the uh, episode link in there so you can go and check that out as well if you want to listen to a bit more of a condensed version of this uh, chat with Sid. But this one is pretty much much the full thing, the full unedited uh, version of our chat. He's a really, really interesting guy. A lot of my old school music mates uh, here in Australia will really get a kick out of uh, listening to Sid's story because uh, especially I know a lot of people um, grew up listening to Mantissa in particular, um, but Sid's just got a really, really, really cool story. So I will leave. Yeah, I know, Larry. Absolutely. Sorry, guys. All right, enough of me. Please enjoy this episode with Sid Green. And by the way, that's Sid green.com.au. Please enjoy this chat with Sid Green. How long's Modern S been up and running as <clears throat> as a as a name, as, as a, a business thing? itself, as a thing, yeah. Yeah. Um I could almost say maybe sixteen years. Hmm. Yeah. Um I my first sort of co producing sort of gig that I got, if you'd call it that was um, I was playing in a band called IOTA and we ended up sort of co-producing our first sort of record and um, and that really just launched my career as that sort of thing, as being a producer and, and that was 1998. It's so gone back a while now. It's 20 years, right? <laughs> I, just, I just did the math. Um, so you could, yeah, you could potentially say it, it's been a 20-year production and then of course cutting your teeth before that by being a musician and seeing the happenings of how to make records and, yep. it, and then it goes right back to that there wasn't computers well there was a, a very big computer yeah. for an SSL to do automation <laughs> yeah. but you know there wasn't email there, it was tape you yep. were splicing tape <sighs> Yeah, you know and um, and that's how you that was the medium we used mm -hmm. and it was normal yeah that was just like 
how are we going to record? Yeah. You know? So it's been really great to come from that and see it build. Uh, actually, one of the band I played in a sort of Melbourne sort of grunge rock band, and I'm sure we're going to go down lots of rabbit warrens yeah. in the next yeah. <laughs> however long we're here for. Um, but, we, yeah, we were probably one of the first bands to sort of partly do a recording at home. Really? Because we we ended up having this amazing record events where we could, we did a lot of the recording of, you know, the drums and, mm. and things that were potentially, well, that were really hard to record at home. Mm. And then um, we had these ADATs, which I, I still have, and they were sort of this first digital medium that you could run at home. And we had this massive desk and the producer sort of loaded in all these gear and we're running all these ADATs. And we started overdubbing at home and and then went back to the studio and linked it all up. I don't, I don't know how they did it. I mean, I do now, but <laughs> yeah. at the time I was like, man, I don't know what's happening wow. here, you know, And um, but it worked. Incredible. So, I mean, you mentioned sort of 98 was around that time that you really started getting into like production. Production, yeah. 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 You would have at the time had other people to leverage off to try and learn. Because I think I was reading on your website, you had a couple of people that sort of acted, you know, maybe as, uh, as mentors. Slight mentors. And Absolutely. they seem to be slightly, uh, you know, notable people. They're very notable, notable people. people. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, look, incredible. I mean, the, the biggest, my biggest mentor and, and, and dear friend, Michael Letho, yep. um, who'd done, who has, I mean, he works for... Um, uh, Rockwiz now, yeah. so he's the full-time Rockwiz guy. But um, before that, he's worked on Rush albums and um, Daryl, all Daryl Braithwaite, mm. all these amazing artists of of the eighties and nineties. Mm. Um, and then we ended up working on a Mantissa record, yeah. and that's how the friendship built from that. Watching him and, um, engineer and produce those records, and then. We just hit it off on a on a technical level as well, and he was so willing to share every everything he had, which was so beautiful, you know. And he cut his teeth at the ABC radio, like mm. being a tape op, you know, when he was oh, yeah. sixteen, you know. So <laughs> his knowledge was. I'm just going to turn that phone down. Yeah, you're right. Um, his knowledge was just so expansive. Um, so you're sort of like the equivalent of like the mailroom boy to begin with. Yeah. And just started at the bottom and then learnt every aspect of... Everything. Yeah. And and again, it's that you cut your teeth doing things like that and the experience and knowledge you gain by the time you get to where I met him, mm. he was a master, mm. you know, a, a master of something that can't really be taught which is really in interesting concept, you know, it's... Had you done any sort of sound production leading up to when you had serious discussions with him about sort of having that interest? Was it something in the back of your mind you thought, oh, I'd love to do that one day, but just yeah. it's not the right time, right place? Look, I think it was one of those things where, as a drummer, yeah. I think they're probably one of the hardest instruments to capture mm. in in a, in a recorded medium. Yep. Um there's a few things that are hard to capture, but the drums are just such a complex instrument. Um, you're using multiple channels of microphones and, you know, all the technicalities mm. that come with that phase, um, tuning. And it, it re you know, I realised early that it, it wasn't something from the heart. You play from the heart, mm. but when you come at it with that, you, it, there's, a, there's a science to mm. it and you... <laughs> You need to know it. Um, and it's fascinating. And you sort of, you end up delving down these uh, places where you experiment and you find the right combination of drums and microphones. And it's trial and error. And it's just this lifelong, lifelong obsession. That's where it started. And every variable will be different depending on, well... The context. The, the context, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. the, the music, the, the other musicians that you're playing with, yep. the room, the actual kit itself, you know, all the nuances yep. that, with the, each and every kit. 
um, and then right down to the finer details of the you know, skin symbols and, and, yeah, and, and that's, the thickness of wood and all those kind of little yeah. things that make such a massive difference. So you're forever, t forever tweaking. Yeah, forever tweaking. And, and every day is different. Mm. Um, and I, I think it's become a real advantage for me because um, there's a lot of producers, a lot of record producers um, in particular that work from their bedroom, you know, mm. um, and... So and it's such a it's an industry industry where it's not really regulated. I mean, anyone with Garage Bank can call themselves yeah. a record producer, and it's that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, but oh, where was I going? So, but it, why I'm saying that because um, I think there's a lot of producers that are not drummers. Yeah. And then I think when you think when I sort of when I started this conversation by saying it's probably one of the hardest instruments to record then that becomes quite a struggle for people that aren't drummers. Because mm. like you say, the nuance, unless you're a player, well, you're either not going to be interested in it or you'll never hear it yeah. as, as in the detail that a player would, you know. And you're probably, you're probably forced on a number of occasions recording drums that you had to sit there and painstakingly wait for them to keep coming back out fix up some tuning, move some mics around, test yeah. things out. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember years ago um, sitting in a control room at 301. Yep. This is years and years ago, and we were recording an album, and our drummer was in there, and I'm pretty sure we spent the majority of a day just working out the sound. Yeah. And it was so tedious, and I play bass. Yeah. My, my mind's elsewhere. <laughs> I, like, like, within five seconds, I'm like a goldfish. I'm easily distracted, and I'm just going, yeah. what the hell is going on I just on want here? to plug in and play. And... <laughs> And, that, and, and to our drummer's uh, credit, I mean, he's gone on to to do a lot of um, sound production as oh, well great. now. Yeah, and awesome. I think it's probably a very similar journey yep. where he was put into a situation where he had to sit there and go through that process because he couldn't walk out of the room. He's part of the, he's he, part of the experiment. Yeah, he was part so, of the experiment. So yeah. that probably, I would assume, would be where... Not so much. Oh, it would have been a natural interest there, but you were almost put on that path already, just given your instrument of choice. Yes. Yeah. yeah which is saving time yeah. uh, for the artist now. Uh, before we ever, when we start a, uh, when an artist band, whoever it is that um, want to come in and, and make some music with me. I mean, that's probably the first things we talk about. What sound are you looking for? What drum sound yeah. are you looking for? And we can almost, um, start painting a picture about the sound before we're even in there. Mm. So I'll know what drums to take in. Um, I've almost got an idea of what mics I'm going to use based on the context, the genre, yep. the sound we talked about. And we're saving a lot of time, mm. you know, for the artist. And I'm sure they're they're appreciating that too because they're probably thinking, last time I was in here, this took a day. Yeah. You know? And next thing you know, we've got a drum sound in an hour. Yeah. What's going so, on? Here? <laughs> Either we're shortcutting something or yeah. this guy actually knows yeah. what he's doing. Yeah. We'll wait, we'll wait well, until we see so, anyway. the final product. <laughs> yeah. Now. Yeah. Um, so, but obviously when you're going through that period of learning and sort of absorbing as much as you can, you've got these great people around you that mm. are giving all their experience to you. I, I did read that you had done a lot of work with different recording studios around the yeah. place and some yeah. really like some really well like world famous studios terry date as yeah. well like who produced Soundgarden, Soundgarden yeah. pantera yeah limp biscuit uh, i mean deftones like all these incredible bands of the 90s like amazing and i probably learned the most valuable lesson from him yeah um in engineering and that was the people skills yeah, yeah, right. Okay. Um, yeah. Get the most out of people. Well, yeah, and under, understanding what what people need and how how they can achieve it. Mm. I watched firsthand a master. Not only was he a technical master as well. Um, the most fascinating thing about Terry was he's not a produ uh, not a musician. Mm. Couldn't play anything, and I think that really gave him the edge yeah because he could really he could just he didn't have any personal um sort of there's no he, attachment to no it. attachment yeah. to anything yeah. it's like he doesn't favor the guitar mm. because he's a guitar player yeah. Or, yeah. or drums um and even more so it was like uh 
how do I de describe it? It's it's like yeah, this full detachment, and really all he had was the science and how to make people behave <laughs> in a way. I, I, manipulate's not the right word, but um, sort of coaching people. Yeah, to, it's to get, just get them in their their be their optimal their best headspace yeah. um, without even knowing it. Yeah. Uh, the real art it's um it, it, i guess it's sort of like sales techniques you're selling a <laughs> yeah, concept <it> <laughs> to a to a person and yeah i mean we'll both no doubt on multiple occasions over the years <laughs> have come across varying people in different um bands either we play with or play like other bands that we play with mm -hmm. um and there's a bit of ego at times and of people course. um are very sometimes overconfident with their ability <laughs> yep. and the recording process can bring out a, a level of vulnerability oh, that, um, that can be completely count counterproductive and oh. everything just cancels out. And so somebody that might actually have a natural ability, but crumbles under pressure yes. and all the eyes and the record and it's on tape and it's oh, there yeah. ready to go. I've only and had that suddenly, happen recently actually. Yeah. And it's, I constantly use the analogy of a microphone is a microscope yeah <laughs> and it, it sort of it magnifies all all your flaws <laughs> and all your genius and and all those things yeah. and um yeah and if you're not ready mentally it can be your undoing it's a very it's a, it's a scary process it's a scary process <laughs> every every time yeah. you know um another I, and i think that's an amazing thing mm. because um it's the imperfections that you're after. Yeah. Because, I mean, if we wanted something perfect, we'd just let Garage Band do it. Yeah, that's it. You know? That's it. So, it's... And I think when you walk into a, a recording, they're the sort of things you're looking for. I, I want to show my weaknesses, and and therefore, you bring those to the surface just as, just as much as the good things yeah. that you do and the skill that you have. So, and they sort of work together and you just get Neil Young, you know, when not the, that I've recorded Neil Young, <laughs> <laughs> but that's the sound, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, I mean, that's what gives it character and gives it mm. that unique flavor. And it's even like the, the stereotypical, <laughs> um, some, oh, the first takes the best, you know, someone comes in yeah. and, and they, they sit down and they've they haven't got to the point where their life's about to crumble in front of them. And yes. so they come in and they play and they turn around and say, oh, wasn't feeling it or yeah. um, I could do better. And then 50 takes later, they're about to throw the guitar across the room or yeah. whatever, whatever they're holding. And they just say, this is fucked. I can't do it. Yeah. <laughs> and, but yeah. then you, then you go all the way back and you listen to the first one and you go, you know what? That first one's actually that was great. Good. And you go, Oh God, like the last four hours we've just been. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. but there might've been one little, you know, the way that the, the feel of that first take, yeah. um, and it may not have been dead on. It may not have been absolutely perfect, but it had enough character and color and texture that it actually was unique and it fits into the context of whatever. Yes. The, the greater picture is. Yeah. yeah. Oh, look, it's a, it's a classic syndrome, you know, and it's, it's because we can't separate ourselves from it you know, as musicians, mm. you know? Um, and I get that. I think that's a great, another great advantage that I bring to the studio. I'm constantly playing as, I'm not just a producer. Mm. I'm constantly being a musician, touring in a band, I see what works live. I see what doesn't work live. I know what it's like to get up and get the red eye to Perth. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. these, um, I'm totally on par with the people I'm working with. And, um, and, and they see that. And I think, um, you can never separate yourself from a, a take. I, I've only had it just this weekend of experienced something where I wasn't feeling it, but I knew, a week from now, I wouldn't, I'd forget the feeling, but I'd be able to listen to it and, yep. and have them separate. So I was sort of, even though I wasn't getting that payoff, that good, good feeling mm. in, in your heart as I was playing, I, I trusted that I'd been here before and knew I was going to be okay. Everything, everything <laughs> is lining up in theory. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, yeah. know. And yeah. that was really, that was a real sort of lesson to go oh, I'm just, it's just feeling awkward. And <laughs> just keep going because yeah. you'll be okay. You know, yeah. this it's not sounding like you think it's feeling. 
Um, but that's really hard when you're in the middle of a record to try and have some have some perspective to be able to stand mm. back and look mm. at it objectively. Yeah. Um, around that around that sort of time, sort of late nineties, and you're working with all these you know great people in these studios. You would were you working as like a, a freelancer and coming into those studios, or were you employed by those studios at the time? What was what did it sort of look like at that stage? Um, <clears throat> the late nineties was a really interesting time because um, so we're talking about whole studios and analog equipment i mean i think 97 98 you had the first sort of really great decent macintosh that was mm. that was big enough to or pc as well but that was sort of big enough to run some record some audio um and then they had the pro tools digi design sort of interfaces that were coming out and that really meant if you could get set up with something like that, you were recording at home, great sample rate, and it hadn't been done before, mm. really. Mm. Um, and it meant you didn't have to go into a studio and watch the clock. Yeah. And go, oh my goodness, you know, this is this is costing, you know, 301's not cheap. Yeah. Um, amazing, though. Like, you, yeah. get, you get every bang for your buck at that place. <laughs> um, um, but, you know what I mean? The the clock ticks there, and, and it's... You got to question what you spend time on, um, so all of a sudden that was gone. You could spend. Well, I think we spent nine months making that iota record. You yeah. Know? So because we had lots of time. Yeah. Um, so th that's where I saw this amazing shift, and I didn't realise it at the time, but I was forging a way. <clears throat> with the times changing where I was going into a profession mm. of saying, hey, I could, if I can do this for myself and an artist that I was collaborating with, well, I could do this for anyone. So even, even at that stage, you were, you were ready to do it as just you, not you working for a larger business and being just, you know, a paid gun that comes in. Yeah. You were, you were, your own a freelancer a freelance in, yeah. a contractor to be able to come in yep. and help out and deal with one artist and that and that's it yeah yeah and and that's when it and that's when it started to really sort of uh i, th I finished that record and i think um yeah some calls started oh, well ida was signed to um mgm so i think i remember getting a couple of sort of small like ep type yep. recording jobs from MGM because they liked what we did yep. with IOTA and next thing you know I got a couple of other sort of gigs where I wasn't connected musically in any way it was just I was purely producing and and making records for the artists when did the name come in Mono Nest mm. um was that relocating down here was that when it came? Or did you already well, I, had it sort of floating I, around beforehand? I sort of had it floating around. Um, I loved, I've always loved the word manoral. Yeah. Um, and if you probably can't tell by now that I'm a big lover of birds. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, things are born in the nest. Yeah. And it's those two analogies really, you know, come together for me. And that's where the names come from. Um, you know, and I guess too, as you... As as you sort of sort of drifting along in this world, you're sort of accumulating things like um, microphones and yep. <laughs> outboard equipment and speakers. Oh, you know, you you get down, you finish something one week and go, I'd really love that microphone. I think it'd sound great on the drum kit. And you're just slowly accumulating pieces of equipment and instruments, drums, and next thing you know. You've got a whole it's bunch of stuff. Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, you, actually, whoa, yeah. you know, it's 20 years of, of collecting based on the things you like and the sounds and and then you need a place to put it. And it just happens to look like a, a music studio, you know. And how long have you been in Sanctuary Point now? 10 years. 10 years. Yeah. yeah. We, we, my wife's an artist as well, um, a visual artist. So... We've had a few breaks where we've spent some time overseas, living overseas, and, and then have come home. Um, 
we've done that twice now so we sort of haven't been here the whole time mm. and and that's been great and that's great for the said um yep. my business so as it were as well so um sh she received a scholarship to go uh with an american art school to right. study overseas well. and um and at the time, uh, at the time, we were doing really well with with the music, and it was like, oh, we can't go now. It's all it's all really working. <laughs> Bad timing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we sort of sat down, and you know what? And I'd had a big, good go at it when you think about it since I was twenty years mm. old. So I was like, okay, let's let's do it. We can just put the music on hold for a bit and see what happens. Um, so we took off. They happened to have a an art school in the Caribbean, so we relocated wow. to the Caribbean, which was amazing. And within four months of being there, I um, we ended up shipping over some recording gear. I bought a drum kit from New York. Next thing you know, I was making a record in the Caribbean <laughs> without any intention. Like the whole time, I was fearing everything that I'd built, but. In fact, it was actually adding on. It was actually adding on so much in so many levels. Like, I got a break for a moment. I I had a moment to look back and reflect on what I've done, mm. but also if I'm on the right path. Um, you know, all those things that you, you don't really get a chance to, or you fear that um, it'll fall apart when you leave. Yeah. Um, all the network you built is going to go. Uh, your mind does crazy mm. things, right? Yeah. Um, but in, in actual fact, uh, because of social media and, and the whole online presence, every my whole network could basically watch me travel the world and travel with me, essentially. Yeah. Um, and it was a, this amazing thing happened because... You know, I was writing, oh, traveling here. I got to do a tour in Canada because... I was, I'd worked on an album with a Canadian fellow, and when I told him that I was in the Northern Hemisphere, he's like, "Dude, I'm going to book a tour. You come and play with me." <laughs> yeah. Next thing you know, we're traveling um, British Columbia, and yeah, it was just. I sort of shut the door here, and a thousand doors opened. Mm. Yet when I shut the door, all I was, I was just fearing that it. That it was going to end. Just clinging on to something. Something that clearly didn't exist. No. Um, so it was wonderful, you know, a wonderful thing to do and really obviously enriching um, to experience that part of the world. It's just mind-blowing. I can't wait to go back there. Even from a technical point of view, like no doubt you would have had to, <clears throat> you would have learned so much from different musicians, different mm. types of music. I mean, and also the challenges of, I'm just having a guess here, but recording in unique environments. Oh, yeah. And, and yeah. so w refining your skills on another level that you wouldn't have normally had that exposure to. Yeah. yeah. I, Well, it was crazy. I ended up doing a, an, an amazing masterclass with this drummer from Germany called Benny Greb. Okay. So on the way to the Caribbean, I decided to go via Germany <laughs> for a week and, and do this incredible masterclass. Um. I mean, incidentally, Benny's coming to Australia in August. Right. But I won't be here because I'm traveling to <laughs> Thailand. Um, so, but yeah, incredible drummer, learnt, oh, just, the lessons are still coming out. Um, but that was, that was amazing. And it, uh, sort of full circle, I, I end up on this tiny island in the Caribbean with 2,000 people on it. Um with one drum kit and a whole heap of time, <laughs> you know, and it was something I hadn't had in such a long time. Mm. Um, so hey, it was beautiful. Mm. It's, um, I mean, it would have been even just when you first got there and having this time that you never had before. Mm. I mean, that would have been a difficult adjustment. I, I went to, cr a little crazy. Yeah. I have to say, because I was so every day, you get up and go, right, I've got to do this, this, I've got to go to yeah. the studio, I've got to take all this equipment here. And um, that was every day. Yeah. And all of a sudden I didn't have that. It was a real adjustment. I, I struggled. 
actually. Yeah. I struggled a little bit. Do you think if you had to go back into that scenario next week, yeah. that you would go through that same process again where you would go a bit crazy or no, have you sort I of learned? I'd embrace it. I'd you go, yeah. right, okay, yeah, bring Sid, it on. <laughs> yeah, Sid, you need to embrace island time quickly. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, because definitely they were the things you, you don't anticipate until you're there. Hmm. Um, you know, really interesting remote place. Uh, there isn't anything to do. Hmm. Stiflingly hot, mm. like just so hot. A bit like today. Yeah. Um, well, twice as bad as today, right? More humid. Dogs, so yeah, yeah, it's um, yeah. So there's a lot. Of, there's not a lot to do, and there's not a lot you can do. Mm. And for someone who's extremely busy, um, who sort of likes to be busy, I guess. Um, that was really challenging to adjust. Mm. We got there and then didn't want to come home. <laughs> <laughs> Get from but, one extreme you know, to the other. Um, you need to come home and pay it off. <laughs> well, well Basically. yeah, absolutely. I mean, but yeah. even to come back and bring everything that you absorbed oh, and yeah. learned yeah. and put it back into the context of what, what you've already familiar with. I mean, you yeah. suddenly get all these extra tools and experience that you can, you can yeah. pass on. So, so um, all the musicians I met along the way, um, and obviously reggae music was so massive there, yeah. and and that was something I didn't have a lot of experience in. So a year of that, and I just fell in love with it, you know, because I had a real insight into where it comes from, and mm. and it's a way of life, yeah. you know. Yeah. And a lot of genres are like that, you know, so... It's just embedded in the culture. It is, yeah, yeah. and it, until you're in it, you don't really get it. Mm. You can like something, of course, but, yep. yeah, so that was really great. Yeah. So, 10 years ago, <clears throat> moving here mm. and setting up, and 10 years ago would have been even worse than, than what any of the stereotypes are now, <laughs> because I know that, you know, from where Sydney is to here, we're about two and a half hours away, yeah, probably. Ballpark, yeah, ballpark, yeah. Um, and it's easier to get down the coast these days. The roads are a little bit sure, better. Yeah, sure is. But, um, but 10 years ago, I mean, you're setting up a business for yourself. Yep. Where all the work normally would be in Sydney or yep. in a capital city, anywhere in the country. And you're moving into an area that's a very chilled, beautiful part of the world. Yes. They're so chilled, quiet. Um, how did you, how did you adjust or how did you go through the process of going, all right, I've got to, I've got to bring money in. I've yep. got to start a business down here or keep my business going. Going, yeah. What, what's, what sort of things did you have to do in those early stages? Well, I think we could go straight back to what I was saying about the studios. Well, there's studios down here too, but yep. in the capital cities are expensive mm. and, and you're usually looking at the clock. So, um, I think what's happened for me, and it was just this really great window where people were tired of going into a, a dark, dingy studio um, and trying to be creative mm. under fluoro lights <laughs> and and watching a clock tick, right? And I think people were tired of that. And, that, and then all of a sudden you have computer-based medium where you could essentially record anywhere. Yeah. Um, which meant, hey, wait a minute, I could sit on a nice couch, chill out, and make some music. Why would I Yeah. Why would I even consider going into a <laughs> studio, right? That's where the window opened. Yep. It was almost like I said, Hey, I've got a place down the coast. Get out of Sydney, get out of the rat race, calm down unwind, relax, be creative. That was the window, right? And <clears throat> and, it, and in some ways, I, I sort of saw it happening. Well, that IOTA record was done just out of Kiama, yep, okay. similar vibe. Yep. Um, and, and I saw that like very early 90s when I recorded at John Farnham's studio, which was on 10 Acres in the Dandenong Hills of Melbourne, mm. beautiful. Like, it felt like you're in another world, <laughs> you know? It wasn't the the city type thing. And 
And don't get me wrong, like, I also think the city has this beautiful charm and energy as well. But, you know, um, it just depends on the style, right? It, you know, if you're doing sort of, like, indie indie rock stuff, you're not going to go to a farmhouse and... and That's it, that's not the vibe. It's not the vibe, right? Vibe, right? <clears throat> so all of a sudden... All of a sudden, the window was I was the guy that produced Iota's stuff, which was very singer songwriter, uh, or a little bit rock, but a little bit mostly folk singer yep. songwriter acoustic. I started getting those style of players, which really meant isolation, tranquility, you know, all those sort of words that you would like yeah. to create. And I thought, um, and I was going out to this beautiful farmhouse that I go to to track albums as well, which I still go to. And um, it's like a family friend that I rent the place from when I have a project. So I still go there and I thought, you know what, um, we could really try and make it work. If I build a studio here, um, it would be the same. So... I know I really just took a go at it and thought, let's let's give it a go. That's the that's the big angle, isn't it? Yeah. It's it's, it's the advantage of getting away from it all and yep. giving yourself some breathing space to be able to be creative and get the most out of yeah. out of the situation. And then obviously knowing what type of musicians and what type of music is going to benefit from those settings as yep. opposed to somebody else that, that probably needs the city energy to be able to get the most out of them. Exactly. So yeah, identifying, identifying the right people for, yep. for the business. That's it, man. Totally. Um, and that's when, you know, um, of course you, you build something like this in, in your home and you're almost halving the costs. Yep. Overheads are lower. Yeah. As well, but also for the artist. Hmm. Um, so, for an artist in Sydney going, well, should I go to 301 or should I go down to Sid? You know, that this, you know, um, okay, Sid's half the cost because he lives down that far. Um, it's going to be chilled, great. You know, next thing you know, I'm the one getting the call, which is really amazing, you know, mm. really fantastic. So, I mean, keeping in mind that you know the the advantages is not having the clock there not having that time pressure yeah um having some form of schedule of course to be able to work through whatever needs to be done but what what would you i mean you're providing a facility gear expertise everything yep. to make it happen but yep. i mean for someone to travel here what would i mean would they stay in the area somewhere what would be what would you yep. sort of do to support them or is it is it something that they would sort out themselves like how does that work for to entice people down here yeah look um I, well airbnb's been amazing yeah. right so there's a there's a lot around here because it is very it's quite touristy yep um touristy in the summer yeah in the winter time you won't see anyone <laughs> yeah. here really yeah. um particularly on the I'm in the lakes just across the yeah. road so it can get pretty sort of cold when the wind blows off the water mm. um, <clears throat> which is great for making music I was going to say that adds another, <laughs> another dynamic altogether yeah yeah so um, look Airbnb it's been really great but since I've been here there's been rental holiday rentals here the whole time and I've usually helped someone find one and I've over the years you get to know all the locals and um so yeah i'm constantly pointing artists in the right direction love it particularly if they've got a band so you know i'll go oh yes you need to, you need to call blah blah down the road they've got a five bedroom house or if it's just one artist airbnb yeah you know what i mean and that's been amazing i reckon that's a great i mean especially if you i don't, I don't know what seasonal sort of work for you is like but mm. you know if if you were still getting a high level of work, even through the colder months, yep. it's typically all of these rental properties and all these holiday homes are empty. Yeah. You're actually, you're providing something to the local area. Yes. By giving them, you know, income and, and, and customers by using their properties, which would normally be empty. Empty. Yeah. Completely so empty. I mean, taking advantage of, of these quieter months for, for everybody else. Yeah. It's yeah. Cool. Yeah, um, look, it's it's really great. Hopefully, someone listening will 
<laughs> a hero way to capitalize on it actually. Yeah, absolutely. Um so it's um but yeah, totally. And same with um the studio in Nara. Yep. Um there's some great Airbnbs along the river. Yep. Um and and towards Berry and Coolangatta as well. Yep. So it it's been it's been really great to have that studio running too. That's yeah, I think it's a I think it's a real advantage because you know, any sort of any of those properties would be relatively cheaper hmm. than than anywhere else. Yeah. So once again, your overheads to record and go through that creative process are lower. But on top of that, the other things that are needed to be spent yep. on are also cheaper because of the location as well. Yeah. So overall, your all of your costs are going down. So you've got you, you're really taking advantage of, of the quiet area and what yeah. it is compared to. Uh, and in intro. particular for bands too, you know, there's there's nothing like sharing a house and um, and then sh share a studio space and create music, but then go back to a house and still hang, unwind, debrief about the day. It's so, it's just builds so much morale between yep. a band and a connection um, that you you do that for a few days consecutively, and you just see the the change in people, you know, you see them, well, they come in and go, oh, I love it. You know, it creates a, it creates a story around the whole process. It doesn't does, it? Like a, yeah. a beginning, middle and end and, and everything in between the ups and downs and yep. people having good days, bad days, but we're, everybody's work, in it together. They're and, in it together and they work and they support each other. Um, and you, you really see that. It's like, it makes, it makes a, a record really great mm. um and the farmhouse does that too where we all stay in in the same place we're all cooking together mm. um there's no tea there's no television there's no phone reception yeah <laughs> you know all you have is the music in front of you and by the a week of that and it, you really you feel like you've been on Mars, been on some health retreat or yeah, something, like a meditation it's, retreat, it's, just to. <laughs> it's, and we walk away, and, and you know we'll all hug, and it's that, it's just such a beautiful connection that happens yeah. um, over, over music, you know, and creating, and and when people bond over a period of time like that, over mm. such, like when you compare just to you know, everyday life for working a nine to five job and yep. things like that. Yeah. It's a pretty unique experience that not everyone gets to go through. Your word of mouth off the back of that would be mm. so strong if people have had that type of experience and they walk away so enriched from the whole experience and of course getting the end product as well. Of course. Most yep, importantly. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> that is, um, it sounds like what they wanted. Yeah. But hopefully yeah, everyone's happy. It ticks is. the boxes. <laughs> but, um, but you know, to be, I guess, impacted so deeply mm. through that whole process, the the want for them to go and tell people about it would be so much greater. So for you, I, I'm just having a guess here. You've guessed the organic word of mouth is probably yep. what's fueling a lot of a lot of the work that comes through to you. Man, when I started this thing, I tried advertising. Um, it just didn't work. You mm. know, it every every job I get is from recommended from someone else at every time or or and occasionally it's like oh I, I heard that record and i realized you did it yeah okay so i'm giving you a call yeah um but most of the time it's someone saying hey you should call sid i had this great we had this great time mm. you know um and it, it really has totally been that at every time so we've met for the first time today yeah and <laughs> first impressions Yep. You're a very personable yeah, great. individual. Good. Like, you know, getting along straight away, like we're having a great chat and yeah, yeah. Like a nice guy. And looking at your stuff online, we've I had paid a bit... Andy to, yeah. I paid Andy to say that. <laughs> Thanks yep. for this money getting exchanged <laughs> right now. Um, and we've spoken on the phone as well. And just like, y you have an advantage where you've got people skills as well yeah. in an environment where it's really needed. Mm. You know, you, you have to deal with people with different personalities. You have to try and get the best out of them. Like we were going back to, yeah. um, you know, before about trying to deal with ego and all these different mm. things and challenges and trying to get the most out of people in the situation. Yeah. For you being, you know, a musician and then going through that whole journey, I only know it because I've 
played music, you know, for a period of time where you're forced into social situations. Yeah. You're a performer. You get on stage in front of people, so you you're do. exposed in a way <laughs> yeah. to begin with. Yeah. Um, you're lucky because you can sit behind a bit of a drum kit. Exactly. Way. I but, can hide behind the drum kit. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, over those years, you've, mm. you've had to – you're forced into situations time and time again at, at shows, recording, meeting people that like your music, people that you play with, where – you have to communicate. You have to talk to people. You have to yep. talk to, you have to network. Yep. You know, and all those things no doubt have been this long journey for you to get to a point where now that going back to that whole word of mouth, that yep. organic way of getting people to come in has been this long journey of just in critical mass, isn't it? Right. Yeah. Where it's slowly one after the other, one after the other. Um, th that's exactly right. And it's, I mean, how do you make something like that? And it, the only way is just start at the start mm. and just keep chipping away at the coal face. Um, and, and every time, just do the best you can. Mm. Um, do, the, do the best you can based on what, what the artist needs, you know. I, I've, I've gone through a lot of sort of stages like... Um, well, like whenever I take on a creative project, like I'm fully invested, as if it were mine, mm. you know, um, which can, which can be, which I think is what people are looking for, right? I mean, it's, the producer is the fifth member. Yeah. Well, that depends if there's five, four people in the band, <laughs> but um, and you know, if you can, if you can get that. Be, and it sort of almost ties back to what I was saying about anyone with a laptop and, and an interface can be a producer now. Mm. So what does the word producer mean? And more the point, where do I come in? What What is it that I'm actually offering? And it's, I think the value is where you can, you can say to me, how can I make this better? Tell me what it is that I can do to make, this thing yeah. I brought to you better. I know. You, I know we can plug some mics in and some great outboard compressors and all the whiz bang stuff that you can get at three hundred one, right? But th there's more to it. There's what are you going to say right now? That's going to yeah, going to flick a switch up, up here in uh -huh. your mind to yeah, yeah. And um, I think that's where the value is, right? Mm. It, it's the it's the value in that I have no attachment to the music. I always say this when we start a project, like the best time you're going to get me is that first time I hear it. And then usually anything after that, I'm as deep as you, <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm, yeah. And I'm going to love it as much as you. So, yeah. um, once we're in, it's, it's a race to the end. I'll see you at the end with this track, you know, but the very first bit when I look at it without any connection, but look at it intuitively, you know, uh, for example, Oh, it's a bit long. What, what if we cut this bit here? And um, oh, it feels a bit high in your register. Should we? Can we try it down low? All those things that usually most mm. musicians don't ask because you're in it. Yeah. Um, you're in the bubble, and there's only one person sitting on the outside. It's usually me looking in. Um, that perspective is. I don't think you can put a price on that. <clears throat> um, so if they trust you enough, based on the things you've done before, i.e. the things they've either listened to or their friends have t told them about experience, you get that trust and it's almost limitless what you can do um, because the artist is like putty in your hand, you know, you can, you know what they need and you can sort of work at ways of getting that delivery and, um, and, and the song and it, and the whole time, there's a friendship building, mm. like just about every, everyone I've ever worked with. We're friends now, you know, because we went and did a thing, you know. Um, and it's that, like I say, completely invested in it. I usually end up loving it every time, you know, because you, I, most of the time I'll always end up playing on something or... Um, contributing not just as a producer but 
as a musician to the mm. to the thing song I should say um, and just taking all that experience into a, a project is I think what people that's what they don't have you know I think that's what's unique about <clears throat> just music in general anyway is that you, you have to be you have to be deep in it because it's yeah. it's a music's this emotional it's it's a motive thing that comes out of somebody and yep. it comes out of some story or event or experience or whatever mm. it is and then by the time it comes to you as you said you're on the outside so of that I'm bubble they're in. deep in it already yeah and they usually got, years deep in it yeah too, absolutely actually. they've like, held on to them for years and yeah. then just maybe they've never even tweaked it yep. it's just been in their head or they've had it demoed years ago and they're just trying to work out what to do with it and suddenly you know you might be turning around saying yeah well, let's uh, let's trim it up a bit it's like whoa this yeah is, i this know this is the soundtrack of my life what are you <laughs> yeah. on about what are you do? what are you saying to cut it you know, are you crazy man <laughs> but you know um hopefully and usually usually and I, there's a few things i'll always say and one is whatever i say is a suggestion only mm. take it or leave it you know i, I think that's something i really learned to do better um because because sometimes when you're really in it you take it personally yeah. right yeah. um um and that's something because people are at different level at different levels in their life mm. uh, whether they're willing to uh be open for someone to come in and essentially critique them yeah um or critique a song not so much their how they're playing it mm. but more just arrangement um, and like I was saying, those examples about changing keys and and the sonicness of it, I guess. Uh, so yeah, that takes a hell of a lot of trust, doesn't it? Like, oh, it does big time. Particularly if you've only met someone for the first time, and there they are trying to. Hi, nice cut to it. meet you. And uh, <laughs> we're going to cut this song to <laughs> little pieces, you know. Like, um, yeah, I mean, obviously, as I what we were saying before. The reputation that you build from mm. mutual people yep. that, that you both know and the reassurance there or the proof in the pudding of what you've been what you've been a part of in the past. Yeah. But then I think just your experience and the things that you've been through and the people that you've worked with, even even if it's disconnected, of just being in the industry gives a sense of legitimacy where it's like you, this is just a suggestion. Yeah. But take it on board and you don't have to spell it out to them. It's yeah. known. Yeah. And that person can actually take it in and go, well, this guy's not just talking out of his ass. Like no, he's, he's yeah. got a bit, he's been around he's for been a here little before. bit. He's done this a few <laughs> times. Maybe I might just listen, hear it out and yep. see or test the waters to see whether it's worth, uh, worth moving in that Move. direction. Or and not. that's usually how it goes, actually. Yeah. Um, most people, are, most people are pretty open for for change and like I'm I'm always one of those people like like I get it like when it's so close to your heart particularly singer songwriters you know they're usually um writing songs uh, life experiences and and that can be really close to the bone mm. so I get it it's pretty hard to be open you know oh let's cut that verse out what do you mean that's the it's a bit about my mum you know, or whatever it is, right? Yeah. yeah. So, um, usually when they say that, I go, okay, well, let's not, let's, not, let's not cut that one. Let's, let, <laughs> no, let's, let's you know. find somewhere else. Quick, quick. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. But, you know, it's, um, I, I, I have I lost my train of thought. But yeah, it's that, it's that thing of being really open. It just, it's a real, it's an art within itself, actually, for a musician to be open yeah, absolutely. To, to find the best thing for the song. I think it's uh, it's a big, deep personal journey that people have got to mm. go through, yeah. um, especially when, you know, any form of creativity comes from somewhere deep. And, yep. and so it's raw and depending on what it relates to, it can have thorns and all sorts of stuff attached to it. And, you know, you've got to try and work with that. And it's yep. a juggle every single time. And it depends it on... It depends on not even the song or the project or whatever has been worked on. It's who is this person? Yeah. What's their demeanor? What's their, how do they normally handle like These situations things. like this? Yeah, and you've yeah. got to read that person yep. as well as whatever 
the project is as well. Yeah. And it, can be a, it can be a juggling act. Massive juggling act. And I think too, like from experience, when, when you do get those, it, it's something I write in an email actually a lot, a lot of the time, particularly when we're doing remote recordings, mm. like what to bring, food for the week, towels, linen, an open mind. Um, blah 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 and I just slip it in there you know because it's it's the most important one Um, yeah now you've you've triggered a thought with me so (laughs) so you give your your I don't want to call them clients I mean they are but like they are but they come in yeah they're not you're giving them a checklist Hmm. of of things that are very obvious Yes. But you put them out there because no doubt you've had experiences in the past where people haven't or just haven't thought about certain things they haven't and thought about they're it. distracted by it and they've got to run out and try and find things. And it's like up front, these are the things you need to keep in mind. Yep. Very simple things. Very simple where things. Where you think most people go, well, of course, yeah, duh, I'll, I'll bring a towel or you know, get yeah, some yeah. food and things like that. Yeah. Um, I met someone a few years ago who's a lawyer and he told me that um, – one of the tactics that he uses when he brings a witness into court yep. is that he brings a roll of toilet paper in his little yep. briefcase. Yeah. And the reason for that is that most people that he brings to court have never been to court before. And usually when people are nervous, yep. it either comes out the top or it comes out the bottom. bottom. And yep. it usually happens right bang when they're about to go in. So, and he said, the amount of times I've gone into court and then my uh, client has gone into the bathroom yep. and then there's been no toilet paper in there. Right. And so suddenly 10, <laughs> 15, 20 minutes, half an hour, and we go, where's this person? And we yep. find out that he's just sitting in the toilet yelling out, trying to find someone who's got toilet oh, paper God. and he's sick. And so he always brings an extra roll of toilet paper. And I laughed when he first said it. Yeah. But when he explained it, I just said, that's just that extra step. It's that 1% extra where yep. you're just making sure that you're covering because every he's possible it, right? scenario. He's, yeah. he's, he's been there before. He's He's been in the situation where he hasn't had the toilet paper and he's made it a uh, you know, it's oh, on top it of the list. It happened again. <laughs> yeah, it yeah. Again. It go, so, yeah. But things like that, I mean, you want to remove all distractions, every possible hurdle that you, you've got control over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So by giving them very obvious things and a bit of a checklist, hey, guys, like, these are the things to think about, then mm. you're saving time and you're saving that in the middle of it. Yeah, in the middle yeah, of yeah, it. Yeah, in the middle yeah. of it. Particularly when, um, you know, particularly because you can... You can butt heads on certain projects and, mm. and you know, there's this chemistry. Get in. That's my <laughs> son who's home from school. <laughs> hey, River. Can we, can we yeah, stop and say hi? Yeah, of course. Right. Yeah. And we're back. Yeah, we're back. We had a little intermission. Yeah, so I think the other thing I wanted to uh, touch on, we and we've touched on it a few times along the way, is that you know, over the years, and no doubt's changed in the 10 years that you've been here, but with the internet, connecting with people, mm. um, you know, you are you, part of this whole pitch that you have for people is to come down here. Yeah. No doubt with internet and being able to swap files and send files that you're doing a lot more work that's remote now yeah. as well than you were probably 10 years ago. Absolutely. Um, there's... Uh there's some great stuff where um, there's a, an advertising company that do a lot of like jingles and yep. stuff, and occasionally they'll write to me and say, um, "I can't mention any names." That's yeah, all right, yeah. but yeah, it's that thing where they'll go, oh, "We need a drum track. Can you do it in an hour now?" <laughs> wow! <laughs> and I'm like. Um, actually I can, <laughs> I just need to put a podcast on hold one second. Um, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's amazing. It's cool. It's so great. Um, and also when, when, uh, maybe about seven years ago, um, a Canadian friend of mine who was living in Australia, we, we made a record here in Australia and did some sort of tours and he had dual citizenship and moved back to Canada um, and he was like, man, I can't, I don't want to make a record with anyone else. Can I make it with you? And I'm like, dude, you live in Canada. <laughs> and I said, wait, well, wait, wait a second, you know, let's try, let's try one. So I said to him, 
um, you know, go into a studio, take your guitar, put down a click track and a, a guitar track and a couple of vocals, send me that and then I'll do it for you. Mm. I'll do the rest. And as you can see, I can, um, a bit of a multi-instrumentalist, right? So I played everything. And it was this really interesting exercise, right? Because here we are on opposite sides of the world mm. um, and I'm sort of interpreting what this song should be without saying to him all these things that I would have said if he was sitting here. Yeah. Dom, is the, are we right in the right key? Or should it be a bit slower or a bit faster? Or can we cut this bit out? You know, <laughs> yeah. whatever, right? Yeah. So I've just sort of gone, okay, I'm listening to these tracks and I'd lay down some drums and bass and some dobro and whatever else I was playing. I'd send it to him and I've, we've become really great friends as, through this whole process. Um, and he wrote back and he wrote something like, oh, oh I don't know if I like it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, yeah, that's cool. No worries. I'll, I'll try something else. And then about two hours later, I got another email. Don't touch it. It's great. No. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's because, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it was because it was such a, a contrast. Like here we are a great example of what we're talking about. Right. So we've got singer songwriters so embedded in, mm. in the, in what they've composed lyrically and musically. And then I've gone and just, interpret it what I thought would be the mm. thing and it was such a change that it took him a few listens to go oh I, I get it but yeah, he's got to initial, remove himself from it first on yeah. initial listen it, it was just so different and mm. he just couldn't get it uh, which oh, I get right yeah um and and it was we laugh about it now which was really great we so we went on to do that record and he 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 said it happened every time. He he go to the studio in the morning and do his guitar bit and send it send it down the line, and I'd send it back in the evening, which would have been his morning. Yeah, and he'd listen and go, ah, uh, oh, I don't know. Within an hour, I love it, <laughs> you know. And it was just because it, it was just so weird. And um and you have to remember, like summertime, we would have been in the middle of winter, so I was feeling the total opposite. Mm. And we ended up getting this thing that had felt so cohesive in the end that you would you would have just assumed we were in the same room in the same city, the same part of the world. But clearly, what we weren't. It's mind blowing. I mean, yeah, I'm sure. Like when you first started recording in bands, yeah, as a musician, there's no to, way I would have thought even that would... grasp that concept. Even now, like, and yeah. a lot more people do it, and it's yeah. becoming more common. But it's still a, a hard thing to, to wrap your head around that, you know, people, something that you put a lot of, I put a lot of importance on, and no doubt you do because this is your life, but from a music point of view, music yeah. is such a, a deep thing. And to be able to create something like that yeah. with such distance in between yeah, pretty. and still find something together, find this common ground, and yeah, yeah it's incredible. It, it really was a an amazing experience and we um and from that experience we ended up getting a um a soundtrack together wow and then we made a soundtrack in the same process um and we were documenting it the whole time like um it was so funny like he was like digging himself out of 15 feet of snow and there i was with board shorts having a surf <laughs> down it for local surf break you know it just this juxtaposition of worlds was the thing that fed it because yeah. he, 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 and at that point he, he'd got some recording gear. So he was recording at home. So things were almost happening instantly or we'd wake up in the morning and I'd have something he'd sent or he'd wake up and there'd be a whole orchestra on the other end, you know? And, um, we just had such a great time doing that. And and the way the guys put it together as the making of it was this great collaboration where we knew each other well enough that we could work together 15,000 kilometres away from each other, you know, like, it was pretty nuts. It just blows, it blows the mind that that it, it's possible. And that's happening every week now, too, yeah. uh, in a sense, not so much 
that far away, but um, the recordings that happen in Nara. Yep. So <clears throat> what's what's fabulous is um, I can have a mixing console here, bring the stuff home, and as you heard, my young son just <laughs> tapping on the door. You know, um, we put him to sleep, and I can do a couple of hours in the evening without disturbing anyone, and then email the mixes to the artist, and they wake up and they're there in the morning. It's so great. Um, they love it because they haven't had to sit there and painfully listen to a kick drum go for the, you know <laughs> twenty yeah. minutes at a time or snare drum. You know what I mean? It's it's a great way of work. I've found it amazingly great to work because they listen to it. It's essentially almost the reverse. Um, I I mix it at home by myself. I send them what I call a draft. Uh, and they listen for the very first time, mm. and they almost have the same clarity that I had mm. the moment I started. And it's so great because it's like the roles reversed, and they usually write back and go, oh, "I really love it, Sid, but the vocal here gets a bit lost." And I felt on first listen this, and I go, "Oh, that's great. That's yeah. I need critiquing because mm. I'm d deep in it." Yep. Yep. So they send some notes, I'll do a draft too. <laughs> send it back. We love it. It's done. And it's such, it's just this great way of um, collaborating and it's all all based on the internet, right? And I think it, I think it also... And smartphones. Well, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that's, that's, yeah. The, that's, that's the next <laughs> thing now. And yeah. that's, that's going to get yeah. really crazy. But I think it's, I think it's helped the the introverts, the people that <clears throat> struggle with face-to-face -face being in that vulnerable situation where they're recording in front of somebody or they're getting critiqued where somebody's sitting across going, mm, you can uh, do better. You can do better. And yeah. it's like, what do you mean? Like, yeah. I am the greatest. <laughs> <laughs> but now, like, people are, are disconnected and there's, there's disadvantages to it as well. But I think where people are removed, where they've got their space to be able to read something, or yeah. get a message or whatever it might be with some feedback. And then they can have their moment where they're like, oh, like, and, yeah. and struggle with it for a moment, but then let go of that a lot quicker mm -hmm. and be able to respond with whatever they need to respond. Totally. With. And yeah. just, it's, it speeds up the process. It becomes so much more efficient. Yeah. You do, you do lose some other things. Yeah. Because you are disconnected. Yeah. Um, so I guess it comes down to the project and, and the music and, and... And the budget. And the budget, of course. Yeah. yeah money's a big thing. It's it's yeah. massive. And, and you're so right about the efficiency of it because at the end of the, at the, end of the day, you're really saving time and money, mm. which can go to other things, you know, posters, pressing. Yeah. Um, you don't need to... You don't need to spend crazy amounts of money you know what i mean mm. it's you could you can sort of do it smart smartly which means you can either spend on those things i just said or make another one mm. you know just keep keep creating a back catalog right well, i mean it's <laughs> eventually a, it's a back catalog. Yeah, that, well, yeah that's right <laughs> i mean it's it, you just you're fortunate because you've got the expertise you've got the equipment you've got everything yeah. at your fingertips and you've got the additional <clears throat> um, advantage, well, not even advantage because everyone else has got it, yeah. is the connection. So you can connect with whoever it is. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. And putting that all together, you're in a pretty, you're in a pretty good position. And no doubt, like, you know, just using the last 10 years, 10 years ago, you would have had, if you're going to percentage it, you would have had more people that are physically here yes. going through that process. And now it might be more even keel where yeah. it's, here and also online yeah or whatever it might be but it's obviously mm. changed as the dig digital age is in yeah has changed as well yeah yeah and it, it also it means i can pick my own hours too like yeah. like i was saying i can come out here from i can do 8 p.m to 10 p.m which sounds a bit crazy but it means in the morning i may choose you know not to start till 12 yeah um or or I'll get up really early and do a little morning session with a cup of coffee and, and really buzz early with a clear head. And and it's just been really that's been great mm. because you can just you can you can just sort of attack something with the clearest head you can. And that's good. 
And that benefits everyone. Oh, absolutely. You know? But even even just, I mean, it's the whole point of all this stuff that we've been speaking about is the the luxury of being able to work for yourself where mm. you can dictate your hours because you know when you perform best, yep. depending on the circumstances or whatever the job is in front of you. You yep. know whether this is going to be a late at night job or a first thing in the morning job or maybe there's something else that you just need to do that day that's completely unrelated. That's right. And it's like, let's move some stuff around so I can still do that. I can do that. And yeah. whereas, you know, somebody else that's doing the old school job, mm. that, that's, uh, they can't do that. It's, no. This is the, this is the structure. You've got to stick to it. Yeah. You've yeah. got to move your life around, around that. Yeah. Um, I have yeah. a bit of that in Nowra because there's, yeah. there's business hours and, and things, but um, it's still flexible, you know, mm. Particularly if people are traveling from Sydney, yep. I can start later and work a bit later because yep. they've got a two hour drive at the front. Yep. Um, so, I mean, it's fabulous in that way. That's it's, cool. It's great. Makes it a long day for oh. musicians though. Yeah, that's okay. I'm yeah. sure. I'm they sure they live. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, now I've got to ask you and we won't, we won't spend a lot of time on this, but Mentissa, I've got to. I've got to touch go, on this. Go right ahead. Cannot miss the opportunity. <laughs> um, Another fifty dollars I paid Andy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm a little bit younger, yeah. so I came. I came up a little bit after the band was sort of up and really sort of yeah, going right. great. But yep. I mean, certainly a lot of friends of mine saw you guys play. Yeah, um, cool. And the bands that you played with mm -hmm. and the success that you guys had in such a short space of time. It was. Uh, and maybe yeah. not at the time. It didn't seem short. I don't know, but like it was a whirlwind. Yeah. yeah. Ma man, most definitely. Uh, yeah. I mean, the, looking at artists now that you deal with mm. and you're still an artist as far yeah. as you're still a recording musician. Yep. I mean, what's the vast difference is obviously recording. We know all that sort of stuff, but I mean, getting started as a, as, as a, as a band then mm -hmm. dealing with all the challenges and trying to get your name out there. And you, I mean, you guys had some fantastic breaks yeah, with some great exposure and played with like ridiculous bands over the chili years. Chili Peppers. Yeah. Chili Peppers, <laughs> Jane's Addiction, Jane's Addiction, yeah. Mud Honey. Mm -hmm. Did you do Pantera? Pantera. Pantera? We Nine, did Melbourne and Adelaide. Something like that. Yeah. <sighs> we didn't do the Sydney show. It was, um, I think Powder, did Powderfinger do that? Or they did a later, they did support remember. in Sydney at one stage, but it might have been later in the piece. It was like yeah. there's one of those mismatches that um, yeah. that still gets talked about now. But, I mean, you guys aren't Pan Pantera as far as sound. You guys right. had a hard edge, but you weren't. The, the only we, – well, we had one thing in common, and that was our – that we had the same producer. Yeah. Um, uh, but when we were touring and living in the United States, we, we ended up getting – being in Texas, and Terry, the producer that we talked about, Terry Day, he, he called Pantera and said, my Aussie mates are going to be down in your way. You should go down and see them. <laughs> yeah. And um, sure enough, they showed up, you know, in this sort of dingy sort of, what town? It would have been in Dallas, Dallas, Texas. Mm. And um, it was Dimebag and, and Vinny. I don't think the other guys were there. But... um. You know, we ended up shooting pool till like 3 a.m. in the morning and having, there was a drink called 7 and 7, which was like this snaps and 7 up. Yeah. It was awful, but we ended up <laughs> drinking it. But, um, you know, it was outrageous. It was, and it, you know, we're talk, talking about successful bands. I mean, that band had broken it big mm. time at that point. They were the biggest thing ever. And Was that still around that same time, like around that sort of 94? It was it was ninety three ninety four that we were there in the US. So, um, and and that night basically, um, we made friends, made allies, yeah, <laughs> and um, and we just got along like a house on fire. And I remember the parting words saying something. They said something like, "You'll be on, you'll be on our Australian tour. We'll make sure of it." So I think. What happened was it had been already booked. Right. And someone's gone, Oi, we want this band on <laughs> at least two of the shows. Okay. So, and, you know, it's all about who you know. Yeah. Clearly. Uh, it doesn't matter how great you are. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how it happened. Yeah. So I, I'm going to guess that a band either 
were pre-booked and got kicked off the tour, or or um, I'm yeah, yeah I'm gonna split guess it, split yeah. with someone else who did the other dates. Yeah, yeah, well, that's right. Yeah, they they got given the Sydney shows. Right, who knows? So, I'll stay on Pantera just for a little bit. But yeah. what what on earth was it like to play to a Pantera crowd before they were about to hit the stage? Because we felt like a stories. chicken dangling above a crocodile. You know, <laughs> essentially that's what we were. Yeah, we were we were bait, live, <laughs> live bait. Um, it was pretty brutal. Yeah, I mean, we were. Look, we were a heavy band, yeah, but yeah. nothing like Pantera. No. Oh, my. Oh, my goodness. Um, and, you know, we were probably more that psychedelic rock thing yeah. where Pantera would... I don't, I don't even know what you call it. They're just hardcore. Just just metal. It's just Holy like... Holy yeah, moly. This sort of groove metal, but it's just... Groove on. metal, yeah. yeah. Particularly... Um, they, that they, album, Vulgar Display, right? Yeah, and I mean, they all love prong and those sort of bands. Yeah. So, yeah, a lot of that. And, yeah. the, and Cowboys was more metal, and the album mm. before that was definitely me- like, Yeah, they had a lot of... They had a bit of a glam era that they sort of yeah, tried to push away. Phil, yeah, sorry, Phil had the hair and stuff. Um, but yeah, uh, Vulgar Display and, the, and then Far Beyond Driven mm. were pretty powerful groove, insane guitar, you know... That was a very intimidating crowd to answer mm. your question. Very intimidating, and I, I think I remember the halfway through that show, a distinct chant of, and I usually don't like to swear, but fuck off, fuck off. Like, <laughs> they just hated it. <laughs> um, but what was really great by the end that they, they just thought, you know what, these guys aren't getting off, so let's let's just get crazy, and <laughs> and they loved it. Hey, by, cool. the, by the end, yeah. but it it was really hard to win them over because anyone who's a Pan- Pantera fan, I mean, they're hard, they're diehards. Yeah. Um, but it was a wonderful experience, and um, and the guys were so just down to earth. I mean, they were just dudes yeah. that had cracked it. Mm. Um, it was so amazing jumping on those massive tours because you you get to a venue and. There'd be VIP passes so you could get through security and, and there'd be people trying to sneak a look mm. in. And <laughs> it was so really, so bizarre. Yeah. Like as a young 22-year-old. And, um, you know, you'd get there and you'd be given these like menus for all the food that was like, coming, like yeah, catering. Catering, yeah. It was just big time, you know, <laughs> big time. And interestingly enough... Finney's drumstick wow. personally given. Literally just pulled a drumstick <laughs> off the wall. <laughs> signed by Vinny. Pantera. Wow. Yeah. And, and it's a Cowboys from Hell one. Wow. That's yeah. cool. <clears throat> so that was... Um, there you go. What a mem- little souvenir, memento. That's cool, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So Vinny gave me that on on that run. And we so we did Melbourne. We did Melbourne and then... Um, I can't remember if we drove or flew, but I think we drove to Adelaide yeah. the next night, <clears throat> and um, and that was just as big as well. Yeah, I saw that and went, "Wow, what a what yeah. an odd matchup!" But the story behind it's really cool, and that it's makes really- and it totally <clears throat> makes sense why why it happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. totally, totally because of the, the connection that we'd made. Yeah, with their with their producer and incidentally our producer. So yeah, and I don't know, I don't know how many Aussies can say now that they had drinks with don't. Vinny and Dime in Dallas, Texas, you know, as well. So I don't think there'd be many. No, I don't think there'd be many. I think you want a few. Yeah, yeah. So pretty cool. Yeah, I think that at, the point, at that point too, I think we got kicked out because Vinny had put the pool cue through the, through the light. <laughs> like it, got, it was really quite rock and roll. <laughs> oh, I, remember, I remember having the old VHS home videos from Pantera. They had like three of them that they brought out around sort of early to late nineties and, um, and like three quarters of these videos, they had the video clips in there as most of the videos at the time had, but um, yeah. they just had all the backstage antics. And I'm pretty sure three quarters of these videos were just them trashing everything. It was just oh this, yeah. They like, were just loose. We, yeah. Yeah. Loose boys. And you know? I just remember being a kid watching and just going, wow, that looks like so much fun. I yeah. think I want to play in a band. Yeah. They what? were crazy. <laughs> and, and you know, you know, knowing that 
how dime ba- dime went, you know, mm. like <clears throat> I rem- I remember like Dallas was probably the first time I heard guns on the street when we were there. So and I rem- I remember they had like quite a lot of money because they all were driving these souped up like pickup yep. well they called them trucks. Mm. I mean, they look like utes yep. here but with the big wheels mm. and um, you know, I'm sure they had guns in the back and all sorts of crazy <laughs> stuff, but yeah, they were they were wild boys, you know, <laughs> absolutely wild. And Phil too, like, yeah. just manic. Yeah. 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 Crazy. Wow. Um, And then obviously, I mean, th- some of those other bands we mentioned before, <clears throat> about, like Chili Peppers, Jane's Addiction, yeah. Mud Honey, I mean, like top tier classic bands. Yeah. Um, of that style. Like, yeah, absolutely. And that, I mean, obviously would have fit in a lot more with a lot of the stuff that you, well, in some cases, in some elements, definitely would have fit in better. Yeah, it's but Jane's Addiction, like yeah. definitely. Um, that was really that was quite an amazing too. I I actually got the because that at that time the band was called Killing Time. Yep. And I just got the audition, so I I was a Sydney boy. I was doing construction and working on a working site and um, a work site, and a photographer friend of mine again, all about who you know. Yep. Um, she'd just done a photo shoot with them. And she said to me, uh, oh, I told the guys about you. You should go down and audition <laughs> for Killing Time because their drummer's leaving. Um, and I I thought, nah, nah, yeah, okay. I just hop, I hopped in an old Falcon station wagon, drove down the Hume Highway, rolled up to this rehearsal space, and I'm oh, here for the audition. Um, we did a couple of songs and... The guys, we had some laughs. Can you stay another day? Stayed another day and we jammed some more. Can you stay another day? <laughs> and it, it wasn't really like you're in, but I just stayed. Hang around. I just stayed. <laughs> and um, it, we were, I was there for about four days and was like, well, cool. I think I think we're good to go. We got a we got a gig um, next week. I went great. Oh yeah, we're supporting Jane's Addiction. Oh, f- what? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, wow, that quick, that quick. Like, I was deep in so, deep but, end. But what? I mean, what bands were you playing with up in Sydney? Were you doing a lot or? Just, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, I was. I was working full time. Yeah. Um, but on weekends I was I was playing in a, like a like a metal band, you mm. know. Um, and they were called Scoundrel, and we do all the, <gasps> we do all the Sydney gigs you know the seven hills in and i've just i've seen that name float up the cobra club yeah um and all those um late 90s yeah no late 80s yeah 89 so you know so i was you know i was 19 19 years old and doing those those sorts of gigs and yeah we were going nowhere fast but i was playing and and i was hungry Mm. You know, just young and hungry. To it's a good time as well where you can just sort of say, everything else that I'm doing in life can stop. It's yep. gone. Yep. This is it. Well, I you mean, just I... Make, just make that decision. I did. I left my job. I think I had a girlfriend at the time. I just walked and just drove away. <laughs> you know, it was quite... So now <laughs> yeah, it was very yeah. irresponsible of me at the time. But yeah, I think it, as an artist, you... You take a chance. It's that. It's the signal. It's that sign that you get, and you've got to you've got to read them. And yeah, you take you take a shot, right? Yeah. And um, and that really that's that's launched. That audition has launched my career. Hmm. To, to 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 full circle on this whole convo, you know, getting to work with those bands, cut my teeth as a musician, tour with some real heavyweights, tour of the world record work with amazing producers that inspire you and then here we are so you gotta thank that photographer friend i i do yeah. <laughs> i do a lot <laughs> yeah yeah therese was the name she's lovely um yeah she obviously saw something in me or probably more the point she saw that I, that i could do it Mm. and um believed in me and that's i guess that's what we all need as <laughs> yeah as, well, someone else as young too. young musicians you yeah. know like um yeah and i think 
you know, a lot of the reason I got that audition was because I wasn't from Melbourne. Mm. There were there were a queue of Melbourne drummers lining up way better than me. Uh, but I wasn't from I wasn't from there. I didn't come with the Melbourne Melbourne baggage. Yeah. Um, I was a bit of new blood, you know, and I think those were the things that really got me that yeah. gig. And maybe it was the smile. <laughs> 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 you know. But, but I mean, it, it's funny because, it's, I mean, you never know until you look back. Yeah. But <clears throat> it, it all boils down to you making a decision at that point in time to go, stuff it, I'm going to get in the car and I'm just going to drive down and whatever. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's going to be a couple of days away at the very least. Oh, and super nervous. Scenery. Yeah. Oh, I was so crazy nervous. and But yeah, like I say, that, that hunger comes from the belly. You really can't deny it when, you, when you're on... You act on it. Yeah, when you're in search of that and with, thing. Were they already pretty well established by that point? Yeah, well, they... I mean, obviously already, they got Jane's Addiction a week later, so they must have been doing something. They were pretty signed. <laughs> well, they, you know, they were trip, Triple J's big, yeah. hot new thing with Ruby's Mind. And, That's right. Um, they just signed that big record deal. Mm. So there were a lot of factors involved in that. So, yeah, they, they were destined for, for big things because they were going to get a lot of money spent on them. And they did massive budgets. Crazy. I mean, you definitely would have, you would have experienced that other end of the spectrum being in an environment like that where a lot of mus musicians wouldn't get that exposure. Like no. in that sense, that sort of experience where you're seeing those big budgets, you're seeing the amount of not just money, but the amount of attention being invested into something. Yep. You know, and that can be no doubt absolutely exciting and intoxicating, but probably extremely stressful as well, where yeah. a lot of pressure's put on a lot the whole of pressure band. a lot of pressure to write yep. hit singles as they were yeah. back in those days um yeah it definitely did come with its um complications yep. you know but i i think we were quite oh i think maybe for me like the guys were a little older than me so i was the sort of baby of the band mm. and i think i was maybe kept out of that stuff a lot Maybe for self-preservation or, <laughs> or uh, yeah, or just preserving, preserving my innocence for as long as uh, <laughs> they could, which, I th which I'm quite thankful for, you know, because it didn't tarnish. I was there to play the drums, play the shit out of the drums. Yeah. You know, that, that was my mission statement, that's it, cool. you know, and um, all that other stuff. And, well, that's why I always, now with all this amazing um, hindsight, I can say, Holy mo we spent three hundred thousand dollars on a record. <laughs> like we all could have bought a house each <laughs> and done it at home. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> but I didn't I wasn't really even consulted no. at that point, you know. Um and probably probably best too, because the two main songwriters were the uh the two that would had it signed the contract, the record contract and um in those days it was about the songwriters and the band was just the a thing. Hmm. Of course, as we collaborated and then moved overseas, we became very, um, very connected. And the, the last couple of records were very much um, a whole, as opposed to early days. You yeah. Know? In instead of just one or two guys writing the song, the rest we of were, they're playing. It's, yeah, it's we were all writing. We were all living together. We yeah. were all rehearsing in the garage together and um and because of that it became this the whole was greater than some of its parts mm. you know which is what a band should always be um like the band 1920 that i'm playing in now that very much that feel really great guys to work with um nothing's ever a problem no ego um it just really switched on how young they are young younger than me yeah um yeah so that's really great does it give you a pre appreciation of everything now because you've had those types of experiences even though you were as you said you're kind of a little bit disconnected from some of the i guess some of the more finances business, yeah. yeah some of the more business aspects of it yep. but still having an understanding of the the of how big 
yeah the whole machine was mm. and some of those pressures that were there i mean no doubt with what you've done since then because I, I would assume that if you were a little bit more involved at that time coming out of that band yep potentially there might have been burnout you might have just gone you know what this is not for me anymore i might yeah. go and do construction yeah, exactly <laughs> i'm going back to work this yeah is I'm, hard. I'm, I'm, I'm like a reliable living <laughs> yeah but um but it, it's no doubt worked to your advantage because you were still hungry for it you still had the passion for it to be able to just continue on mm. and just pivot adjust a little bit and and keep going yeah look um it things like that um there's definitely transitions like low times mm. high times so um yeah that whole band dissolving and then sort of getting s spat out yep where you go where you're sort of standing in i think i was standing in a, a cross street in Malvern, <laughs> victoria um just out of the cbd and i was just standing there just going well i have nothing here I don't have any family here. I don't. What am I doing here? Get in the car and drive home. Do you know what I mean? Wow. With, with six years under my yeah. belt of, whoa, that was a big whirlwind. Um, but, you know, Iota was a yep. massive Mantissa fan. Mm. So I ended up, I practically didn't audition for a band again because it, people knew who I was. Mm. Uh, oh yeah, the drum in that band. I, I remember seeing them at Annandale, or do you know whatever it was. So, and that's been. It's just just started again. Off we went, and, and um, and I, I always say it's almost I'm a bit like a cat where I get I've had almost had nine lives, like <laughs> nine bands that that are you know successful, whatever that word means. Yep. Um, you know, I think successful probably usually means happy, mm. you know, happy where you're at. Um, and that's, yeah, that's where we are. You know? I think um, and the advantage of creating music is it's timeless, you know. So yeah, you can, you can record something 20, 30, 40 years ago and no one hears about it and then yeah. suddenly one person picks it up out of out of the blue and the most random of circumstances and yes. goes what the hell is this and then suddenly there's a whole group of people listening to it mm. and and i mean i i still from a listener point of view and a fan of music i still find songs that were recorded long before i was even a thought yes and yep. And I go, this is amazing and i just think wow like for me as a musician who's played on records that and sometimes you go oh man like wish we got more exposure or wish more people yeah. liked this or whatever yeah. it might be but you think i'm only just discovering this band from 1973 right I know, now I know. and <clears throat> like who cares like the music's out there now yeah it's done it's archived it's archived which it's, is it's on historical record it's timeless and and as long as uh as long as it can be accessible then yeah anyone can find it anytime and i think that's really cool and i think i think that's a level of success where you've left you've left a footprint somewhere yeah i think that's yeah, just totally that's so cool you know the you've been really lucky and i think super lucky. um <laughs> and and i've been lucky in in the sense of not to not to that magnitude but yep. we've we've had some really good success over the years and done a lot of overseas touring we've great. played some great amazing bands over the years but yeah um i think i think all of that even aside you know to be able to have that footprint left is is just is probably the most important thing because you know for me discovering a band from you know a decade ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago i don't know about all the tours you might hear some stories that linger sure, on i don't yep. know how many people showed up to that show or how many people yep. didn't buy the album at that time or yep. ignored ignored you or whatever it was but i know how awesome that music is right now Mm. And I can I can feel the energy. I can I've got all the hooks are there. The great guitar playing, the atmosphere, whatever that vibe is. And then in the context of where I'm at at this point in time in my life and yep. where I'm listening to it, yep. becomes part of my narrative for my own life. And Isn't so suddenly I'm seeing it completely different all over yeah, again. Yeah, yeah. So it's just um, it's like it it gets to live again. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Wow. All right. And I think I think anyway. I think that's part of that whole success thing. So yeah. yeah. I, I've never really heard it 
delivered quite like that. That's really Hope great, that man. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was in it. All right, drop the mic. <laughs> <laughs> I was totally there. Throw it on the ground. <laughs> no, that that's really great, and it almost. It almost, um, you could put that full circle too, where the responsibility to, re to record something to the best of your ability, based on, it might be 50 years that someone will listen and go, wow, they've really captured that. Yep. They, that's great. And that's really relevant right now. Mm. Again. Yep. Man, that's Hist cool. History repeats itself. Mm -hmm. You know, human behavior, the things that everyone sings about. And like, I cringe when I hear a band throw lyrics in with things such as email or Facebook. Oh, I, yes. I, and I go, oh, God, did yeah. you really do don't, that? Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> but, but then sometimes it's kind of cool because you are leaving a bit of a time capsule of whatever was happening at that time. And it is a big yeah. part of our life. Yeah. But, um, but I think human behavior repeats itself over and over again. Mm. I think the things that people worried about we worried about a hundred years ago are still things that people worry about now. And so you record something now and yeah, 50 years later, someone can still relate to that because it's just raw human emotion that yeah. you're conveying. Well, Zeppelin. Yeah. Zeppelin's yeah. a great example. You can put that, that feels like it was done yesterday. Yeah. Every time I hear it, it blows my mind that it's, it is 50 years old. Yeah. That's great. Great. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, on that really sort of deep note, mm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, it's been wonderful. Really, really cool. Great. Um, I'll put links up to everything. Great. I'll find some old Mantessa videos and some other stuff. As They're well. out I'll, there. I'll go through. I'll I'll put a nice big show <laughs> reel up of uh, everything you've been involved with. And, That'd be great. Um, yeah. Thanks yeah. for your time. Not a problem. Coming out. Great. Man, what can I say? Cool afternoon chat. Yeah. All right. Man. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. See you. Thanks, everyone. If you want to reach out to Sid, you can do so by going to sidgreen.com.au. Um, and that's where he's got all of his uh, details about MonoNest as well. You can search for MonoNest on Facebook as well. But um, as always, if you want to check out everything that we spoke about uh, from this episode, you can go to the show notes over at andysocial.net for this episode. And as mentioned at the beginning of the episode, I will have a more refined, a more uh, cleaned up and shortened episode of my chat with uh, Sid that will be featured on the Self Starter podcast, being uh, Mono Nest, um, being a business that's uh, on the south coast of New South Wales, and it's something that he's created himself. Um, he's a great candidate for the Self Starter podcast. So once that episode does go live in the coming weeks, I will update the show notes over at andysocial.net where you can go and check out that version of our chat as well. But a massive thank you to everybody that's uh, been listening to the podcast. As always, everything's over at andysocial.net. If you want to buy a t-shirt, you want to shout me a beer via the paypal.me button, leave me a review somewhere. Um, everything helps. And I just really appreciate you guys putting up with my voice as I waffle on right now to try and get to the end of this episode so you can listen to that next podcast. All right, guys, <laughs> take care. See you guys next week. Ta-ta. You're ready. You're ready.